So I'm Julie Spencer, Assistant Superintendent for Research and Accountability. And I'm Beth Gifford, I'm the Director of the Durham Children's Data Center. And so we partner and, and have a um, memorandum of understanding of how we um, partner together with certain projects. And so the projects that we work together, um, obviously until the Durham Public Schools, the data from our students um, and the projects that we have are ones that we've initiated to say, hey, will you help us um, and, and work with our data? And actually they provide additional staffing um, both Beth and um, you Ubi, buy. who his background is. He actually has, he, um, he has a PhD in a social science, actually it's health policy, but he does most of the data analysis for this project. And so um, they, and, and kind of even thinking about those of you that, that were talking about getting into the school system, having that practical experience, as, as you've learned and as folks often do not really understand that school districts that our data is just really it does not come to us all you know like what your professor gives you for a class project as somebody gave that analogy earlier you know there's a lot of cleaning and a lot of um, understanding what could go together and what could be used as a measure and what um, thinking about like what well for us the kindergarten through third grade project is we need to better understand our kindergartners through third grade especially like entering kindergartners our community is really wanting to be is really interested in preschool and what what would we do to better prepare our students for kindergarten and what people learned is that there is very little data to track and measure regarding students entering kindergarten. So new, I think this year, may have been last year, is a new statewide kindergarten assessment, but it is not one that's um, an easy one to track, and nor is it one that we even have access to the data. And so even if we had access to the data, I'm not sure that it would be that helpful. And so as we began thinking about um, our literacy, kindergarten through third grade um, because as you know most of you know our students in North Carolina are not really assessed in a standardized assessment until the end of third grade and they the only kind of well I guess you could say there's a beginning of the year third grade so you could do a kind of third grade um, but there's not kindergarten through second grade kind of systemic standardized assessment um, up until a few years ago when M-Class came into the picture, which is a reading assessment, literacy assessment, and um, as we began talking, and this is kind of the dialogue that, that we go through regularly, I felt very uh, uncomfortable using that in lots of ways because it's very much intended to be a formative assessment for teachers to help students with their reading and to do progress monitoring and kind of gives the interventions and to go you know and teachers are doing their own students so of course you're dealing with the you know this teacher gives it this way and this teacher gives it this way and this school gives it this way and this school gives it this way so you're dealing with all of those factors and so M class became ultimately became kind of our number one way of thinking through kindergarten through third grade um, and how our students literacy skills are um, and then as I mentioned earlier this morning we also have added it, it was in place but not from it was very formative it was only for teachers to know their students I'm going to ask them I'm going to assess them and figure out how many letters they know how many numbers they know can they hold scissors can they you know do they know their colors different things and but it was not really monitored or measured at the district level because it was for teachers to get to know their students and so that assessment is now in place um, so that we can do some level of monitoring at the district level and begin doing some relationships um, looking at different relationships there but then also thinking about what do we do kindergarten through third grade to track and monitor because what um, what we found and I don't know that this is uncommon but 
if you really if you really dug into the data in Durham Public Schools, what you would find is that your third grade test data becomes your, it's very, I mean, you have some students who grow into proficiency and some that drop out of proficiency, but over time, your third grade is your fourth grade and there's small increments of change, but the same group of students who couldn't read in third grade are the same ones who struggle in sixth grade, in eighth grade, in ninth grade, and not so much at the graduation level, but also at the graduation level. And if you really took M class, no surprise, but it's nice to see it in paper and to be able to have the conversation, guess what? The same group in third grade is the same group in kindergarten. And so it just gives the teachers and the schools and the district, um, as we begin thinking about that data set, begins giving us um, more in-depth conversation of how to make a difference and if you you know for those that are teachers the earlier you start um, when students are really can soak it in um, and they're not coming at it from a deficit but they're coming at it from a adding on then the better off the students are so I think we're in the early stages of being able to, to use this data and really aim and target our K2 to um, to, to improve student achievement. Thoughts? Um, Any? None on that. So that's kind of the background of the project. Um, as we think about the K-3 um, project, uh, when Beth and I go back to the very beginning, we looked, you know, we identified what are our research questions I shared earlier that that's like the most important piece. Um, in my opinion of the project because you could go a thousand directions and it really was around what are the success indicators and what are the trends and so take it down into demographic take it into schools um, we've not taken it into like the teacher you know specific teachers but can and will at some point um, but our, our students in first grade you know you know what are the trends and um, characteristics that are happening in first grade but if you really look at ours our data um, you know starting at the beginning of the year kindergarten oh, I should tell you one for those of you are, are there any elementary ed folks in here so you know in class and you know what I'm talking about okay good you can help me um, on this because my background is actually more secondary uh, but in class is it is formative and teachers give it three times a year. They give it at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. And, it, and the teachers who have given it know it takes a lot of time. Um, it, it's very individualized for that student, um, and it gives assessment. The, the main part that we've looked at thus far is the TRC, and so a book level, and really thinking about um, you know, a student's book level and really for me, I had to learn things like, wow, in first grade, they add writing to it. And so you see a little dip for students and how much, you know, for us to think about how much of it is writing versus reading and comprehension. So, but really looking at kind of one of the main things I wanted to do was to say, okay, let's look at our students who are successful at the end of third grade. Okay, so they take their end of grade test and they're proficient. Um, what are the qualities? What are the characteristics? What do we know about that group of students? Are they in certain schools? Um, even thinking about the subgroups that we measure, students with disabilities, limited English proficiency, AIG, where, where do those students fall? And then backtrack them where were they in second grade where were they in first grade where were they in kindergarten um, and then on the same on the same kind of thought is the students who were not successful what do we know about them and so I will say for us and we're you know kind of at the beginning stages of really digging into the analysis part but thinking about um, a large number of our students come to us below far below proficiency in kindergarten and our our um, 
deficit right now is what do we do to, to bring them up. I would say the descriptive analysis that we have is that we're not moving the kindergartners that come in far below, we're not moving them out of far below. The ones that are proficient and far above proficient, guess what, they stay there. But the ones that are not, that's, I would say, is kind of one of our major findings. Yeah, I would say, so last year when we started this project, we only had three years of data, so we couldn't follow students from kindergarten through third grade, because we would need a four years of data. So we followed kindergartners through second grade and first graders through third grade. And one of our, actually one of our very first steps was to do just descriptive analyses um, by school of, we started out just working with the TRC, the four levels, which are far below proficiency, below proficiency, at proficiency, and above proficiency. And what we saw is actually, when you looked at it by the school level, it was really clear that there were some implementation issues. So in part because we were using the first year of data collection, right? And so, so we would see schools either where at the beginning of the year, it appeared that in some schools, they didn't want any student to maybe feel bad. And so everybody looked like they were starting out really high. And then by the end of the year, their proficiency level had actually dropped. Or And so some of this was, it was clear that this probably wasn't real. It was more about how are we implementing the project. And, I think, and we worked with the literacy specialist who then went and took some of this feedback back to the teachers and, and worked on some of the implementation issues. Um, but still, we've been able to work with the data. And, and one of the, can I talk about a little bit about one of the analyses? So one of the analyses we did look at was so there is sort of this continuity between students who start out far below in one grade or like they start out far below in the next grade. So we looked at students who who sort of escaped the far below category. And so by by the third grade, they were passing the, um, the EOG, which we defined actually as scoring a four or five. So it went from far below proficiency in first grade to, to college and career ready. And so we saw that there was about, I want to say about 40% of the students who started out far below had sort of escaped that. And then we looked at characteristics of what, what predicted that. Um, one of those characteristics was related to, to students who had missed a lot of school were less likely to escape that category. I think our, I want to say our limited English proficient group were less likely. Um, so they weren't, the results weren't shocking, but, um, but it was sort of informative to see that so not everybody's escaping, but some, some students are. So kind of to that point, kind of key finding was this whole notion of the students that come in far below and how do you move them. And I would say that still is very much a work in progress for us. I think we're now to the point of realizing and understanding the magnitude of, of that particular um, data point. With another kind of key finding came from um, looking at kindergarten. So I talked about a little bit about the kindergarten assessment data and looking at what we had previously been doing for kindergarten assessment data, even though not all students took it. So we found those students who had taken it and matched it with their EOG score you know, four years later, so they take it at the beginning of kindergarten, so we're matching it to their third grade um, data and kind of looking at that relationship. And really, um, there, there, I would say there was a relationship, uh, not, but it's not like there was one thing that you said, oh, if the student could do this, then they were going to be successful. The um, the highest or greatest relationship was around letter identification and then number identification, which is probably not really that surprising when you think about literacy and um, preparing students for reading. Um, we could go on to say, so now sort of going forward, I think we've actually slimmed down some of the questions that, that teachers are, are collecting on all of the students, but we also have changed the format so that we should have information for all of the students across the district. So we've, we've done two things to sort of make the data collection a little simpler. So, this, well, and even with that, we actually, when we redid the new kindergarten assessment based on this, we took some things out and just said there is no relationship between 
I think, for example, whether a student can hold scissors or not, that was one, their motor skills. It might be formative for the teacher to know that, but there's no real relationship with the literacy skills. And so that's an example of something that was actually removed from our district level assessment. Anything else on? No, I mean, it's just a little bit about reducing some of the burden for, um, to improve data collection. So, then looking at, um, this, is, this is a good one, just the relationship between M-Class and EOG scores, and is there one? And um, there is, and so this is where we were able to track a, a group of students. This is the first year where we've actually had kindergarten, the group that was end of grade, third grade last year, their scores was the first group of M class, even though at that time it was not in all of our schools. Um, but looking at the students who have, I guess you can say four years of um, M class, as well as their EOG and looking at the relationship. And so there was a relationship and it's different, you know, varies a little bit by grade and BOY, MOY, EOY. Um, first grade, beginning of the year M class was a a very strong relationship to the third grade EOG. Um, anything on yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it just increases the closer that you are to taking the test, which isn't surprising, but I think the idea was to be able to start to show the connection between what's learned in kindergarten and first grade to the end of third grade to sort of motivate the whole system to work kind of collaboratively. And that starting in third grade and focusing on the third grade EOGs, that we really need to be starting to focus a little bit earlier. Okay. Can I give one more um, finding? Because yes. this is my very favorite, and I mentioned it earlier, which is, and, and especially for those of you that are elementary um, ed folks, Another example of one of the findings is um, the state says that in third grade that if you are at a P book level, so imagine your book levels go from A to I think U, um, but it, and th at the end of third grade you should be at a P, um, and supposedly that is proficient, and so we actually took that and and put it with our students only to find out that for a P, for example, only 23% of the students who had a P also made a level four or five on their EOG. So we had schools who were really aiming for a P and really pushing to get a student to a P. And guess what? And not enough. And so then you say, oh, well, keep going down the alphabet. And so if you finally, if you got to a T, 70% of that group of students made a four or five. And then if you got to a U, 90%. And so we have switched the um, conversation with our elementary folks. Uh, we need to, at the third grade level, P is just not good enough. You know, our students have to be at a higher level. And so, um, you know, obviously teachers are working as hard as they can, but I also really believe when we have clear guidance and clear benchmarks and we're already measuring those benchmarks that there is going to be greater success um, when it comes. So that's, you know, Beth gets really, um, I'm sure tired of me saying it, but like out of all of this, that is just to me a game changer for schools that you would change your conversation of what your what your threshold is um, for success and so um, that conversation is a very fun one to have because you see people um, in schools realizing wow when we do research and when we um, look at data and we dig deep in data the, the kind of information that you can find so that's just something also that i've been trying to take backwards now so what's the level that you would need to be at in each of the grades to, to be meeting benchmarks so that it's not a shock at third grade. Um, so do we want to take some, ans uh, some questions? Some answers, if you have answers. Let me take answers too. This is beautiful. These are really powerful findings, by the way, that little part um, But I'm curious, so you were, Julie was mentioning earlier about protecting the, kind of the trickle down of protecting everyone, the teachers, the principals. 
So do you both engage in conversations with the principals about this data, or is it just like people from the district or some third person? It's a great question. Both. We both do. Yeah, we both do. So what we did with this report, I mean, so first we showed it to to just two people. So um, what is Stacey Wilson on this? Uh, Our deputy superintendent for academics. Okay. And Tim Gibson, who, who is at is like our elementary director for teaching and learning. So we met with those two first, and then we met with a group of about maybe seven folks who included um, ESL folks, EC folks, and a, a few more of the literacy folks. And then I think actually um, Dr. Wilson Norman took the report and kind of added to it too and, and, and expanded on it, and then she presented that at even a board meeting. So it's I would say most of the conversation at this point has been with district staff who lead kind of this is under their umbrella with the exception of when I have time with principals I for example shared I didn't share the whole you know all all of the findings I gave the to principals I gave the P to you piece and you know this is the table this is what the data says this is a take take away for you to go back to your school and rethink um, and so and I'm trying to think if I also did that with somebody else that was like elementary assistant principals maybe there was somebody else and so but kind of the most of the information is coming I don't know maybe maybe we're both doing it but the kind of folks who lead elementary teaching and learning, that they would take it back. Um, uh, Dr. Wilson Norman, what she did was took it and then identified, used it as one piece of kind of schools that we need to look at that are clearly doing some very positive work. Um, and then also some schools like that have some question marks, like for example, why is there such a discrepancy between the M class scores in this school and the EOG score? You know, like they're the third grade M class and the third grade EOG have a lot more passing one or the other, kind of thinking through the um, actual assessment. Have you uh, had any conversations at your school um, as it relates to? I hate to even ask this question, but as it, <laughs> as it relates to the data, the K3 data that's in EVOS, um, in comparison to what um, you've done and the, the analysis that you had, because that's one of the biggest complaints that we have when we, we show teachers um, their M-class data and their proficiency data, but then when they go into e uh, EVOS and those growth scores come out and they look completely different, um, and they can't it's hard to have them understand the differences between the two. With, up to this point, we have not we've not done anything with the EVOS M plus information. Okay. Not because not for any not because it's been a conscious decision to do it or not do it. We mm -hmm. just haven't. We okay. you know we've had enough to where we haven't had to. Okay. Um, and teachers haven't questioned or um, asked how does that have on the flip side teachers definitely talk and ask about the k2m class and evos and the um i want to say the disconnect i, th I do think that there's enough questions to to say that there's a disconnect for for many teachers in understanding that data mm -hmm. um, i would say we deal with that in a in a different context than actually this than this research that's a good question I was wondering why you took level four and five, not three, four, five, because were your analysis that were uh, predicting the further from third grade to fifth and eight, were they using three, four, five? Because we haven't had five for such a long time. We're, I am doing some analyses now for our next report, and we're just, we just have two different dependent variables, and one is three, four, five, and one is four, five. But I think that the goal is to get as many students as possible to the college and career ready status. So that, that was the only reason. But we're, we are actually looking at both. I had a broader question about the data center. I think in the first earlier panel, and um, 
please correct me if this is wrong, but you talked about sort of merging on or combining social services data with the education data to get a better picture of lots of factors that might be influencing students' achievement and readiness. Could you speak about some of those potential data sources, your hopes for them in terms of research? So we have not done any of that yet. I think that there are potential budding questions. So I, I do meet regularly with the director of social services, and, and he potentially wants to know questions um, about how his children, who he technically has custody for, or, children, or in foster care, how they're doing. He also had a program where any student who had missed X number of days, they would send out a social worker and then um, over the summer to try to encourage them to go to school. So he would like to know about that. Um, so I think that there, there's the potential for, for budding relationships, but there's a lot on the MOU side to, to work out. And um, so we, I don't know that we're 100% there yet. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. All right, Matt. Well, my real quick. Have you developed any interventions, maybe experiments on the basis of what you found? I would say no. I think right now we're more working on for dissemination and then letting the folks who are in charge of that department kind of lead the way from there. That's that's just we've really only been up and going in terms of actually having data to work with for a year. So I think not a specific intervention like an instructional intervention, um, but kind of from a district improvement intervention. I think I think this. This information and this data has very much been, is, I guess, at the early stage of really launching, looking at specific schools situations. And so, and, you know, a large district, and, and Wake is the same way, Guilford's the same way. Um, at the district office, it's very hard to, to drill down and begin kind of thinking through individual needs at individual schools. And so, I think that would be as close as what we've been doing. We yeah. try not to call schools out, you know? Yeah, and that's kind of where we are, though. You have to address what the data is. And says. one more thing to add on to that, though, is I think we are trying to identify um, some key points to monitor and to, to use research to do that. And so if you think about evaluation as a potential intervention in and of itself, you can look at this as an intervention. I'm trying to feed back more information more quickly to, to the right people. Well, that was quick. Um, thank you, Julie and Beth, for presenting to us. Round of applause, please.